Um, so first I want to thank Elaine and uh, the group for having us here today. It's always a pleasure to get to talk about the research that you're doing. We all spend so much you know, time thinking about what is it that we want to spend our time doing um, and how do we make it happen. And so it's fun to share that with a variety of um, people that we cross paths with. The other is I think this is a little different crew than we usually talk to. I mostly speak to cardiologists and heart fire nurses and others. And so I, I look forward not only to letting you know a little bit about what we're doing, but also about some of the medicine that you may not see. But I also hopefully we'll get some feedback back from you all about some of the methods um, that, we're, um, that we're employing um, as we move forward. We're early in the project, so if you have good comments, they'll be extremely helpful for us. The last comment I wanted to make is that um, uh, I, I was invited to give this lecture and I thought, well, that's ridiculous because um, this project is such a good example of team-based science. You know, there are labs that do things and there's, that's not an exception in the clinical world. We cannot do the work that we do without working together. And so it's a little bit, um, uh, you know, dishonest for me to get up here and tell you about the work that I've been doing because the truth of it is that I'm not totally sure what I do, but I do know what these guys do, which is um, they work incredibly hard every day to make this happen. Um, and so this project is really the ideas of largely of Dan Matlock, his experience in shared decision making around end of life, the real hard work of Colleen McElvin and who's our nurse practitioner on the inpatient heart fire service who delivers an incredible amount of care every day but has tons of personal clinical insights into what it means to, to be dying of heart fire and think about getting an artificial heart. And then Jocelyn Thompson, who joined us about a year and a half ago and has been um, a, just an incredible research assistant and now a project coordinator for this project and really makes it go. Um, and I, 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 she kind of tells me what, instead of her, her asking me what to do with the IRB, I say, and what am I supposed to do? She really has kind of taken over the leadership role for the project. So we're all here to present today. We don't really have any, I think, relevant uh, disclosures um, and then let me just give you a brief overview. So we'll give you just a very brief outline of what a destination therapy left ventricular assist devices are. You've probably heard of them, um, but we'll give you a little more detail. And then I'm going to spend a little time talking about where I think there are some real gaps in decision making around end of life. And then we'll try and spend the majority of time talking about what we've been doing in terms of this project and what we plan to do. So without further ado, Colleen McElvin. Great. Thanks, Larry. I think everyone can hear me. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background behind destination therapy, LVADs, and advanced heart failure. The clinical course for heart failure is unpredictable, and people enter advanced heart failure when oral therapies fail, and it becomes a time of major decisions for both patients and providers. Often, the options for patients with advanced heart failure include hospice or palliative care, or choosing to undergo a major surgery with implanting a left ventricular assist device. When providers have patients who enter advanced heart failure, it's important to have conversations with patients and families to help elucidate goals, preferences, and values. Further, prognosis is not only about expectations for survival. There are multiple domains that are of varying importance to individual patients. For example, this slide shows patient-identified outcomes other than survival that include quality of life as well as costs and burdens. The artificial heart pump has, become a long, has come a long way over the years. Barney Clark in 1982 was the first patient to be implanted uh, with the Jarvik artificial heart. Um, it was a 400 pound mach machine that didn't let him leave his hospital room and he only lived for about 112 days. Now moving on to 2010, Dick Cheney was implanted with a partial artificial heart, one of the pumps that we currently use today. And he was able to wait outside the hospital for 20 months um, for a heart transplant. So what actually is an LVAD when we're talking about a left ventricular assist device? So there's certain parts to an LVAD. It's a partial artificial heart that sits inside the left ventricle and pumps blood through a propeller or a pump up into the aorta and out to the systemic system. Patients then are connected to a drive line, which is a power cord basically that's tunneled through uh, the abdomen and comes out and connects to the controller, which is the brains or the computer of the LVAD. The one thing about the LVAD that it's important to know is there's multiple external components and patients must be connected to an electrical source at all times. 
So that's either batteries, which weigh about three pounds a piece and last anywhere from six to 12 hours, or they plug in directly into an electrical wall outlet. So when we talk about destination therapy LVADs, what are we actually talking about? LVADs initially became mainstream as a therapy to stabilize and bridge patients who are waiting for transplantation. However, FDA approved in 2010 was the DT LVAD, which was an artificial heart technology that expanded to people dying from heart failure who are not eligible for transplant. And just to reiterate, DT eligible means you are not transplant eligible. So that opens the door for a lot of patients who are too ill to get a transplant, but not so ill that they need to go directly to hospice. So patients most, mostly are DT eligible due to advanced age, so greater than 65 or 70 years old, comorbidities, or psychosocial problems such as lack of caregiver or substance abuse. So by definition, DT eligible, eligible patients are a sick population and problematic for both patients and providers when making this decision. Frailty also becomes an issue, which can lead to post-operative complications, impaired health status, and reduced survival. And the DT LVAD tsunami is coming. We know that more and more DT LVADs are being implanted each year, and it's for a multitude of factors. Number one, heart failure is an epidemic. The prevalence of heart failure, the people that are living with heart failure, is increasing, mostly because we're keeping people alive longer with the therapies that we have. Number two, the donor hearts have remained relatively stable over the past 20 years. The green bars um, show between 19, the 1980s up until 2011 in the North American region of donor hearts, and you can see they've stayed relatively constant. And in response to that, technology is improving. So manufacturers and companies are developing smaller, more durable, and more implantable devices. This is just a slide to show the DT LVADs that have been implanted in the United States over the past several years. So you can see the red line is the continuous flow pumps that we currently use. In 2010 was when the FDA approved the use of these, so you can see the spike. So about 550 were implanted in 2010, and then up until 2013, there was over 1,000 that were implanted. And this year, they're projected, um, DTL beds are projected to surpass heart transplants. And there's also this magical number needed to treat of two. So this is actually an overlay of two Kaplan-Meier curves that are reported in some of the major trials for destination therapy LVADs. The bottom gray is actually um, the rematch trial, which was in 2001, which is a landmark trial for um, LVADs in general. And it compared the older pulsatile flow LVADs to medical therapy. So you can see the bottom line, was, which is optimal medical therapy, the two-year survival is less than 10%. It was about 8% reported in the trials. The blue line is the newer HeartMate 2 data, which was in 2007, right before DT LVADs were given FDA approval. So it was continuous flow LVADs compared to the older pulsatile flow. So you can see the pulsatile flow did not change much, but those continuous flow LVADs had two-year survival of greater than 60%. Now we know LVADs can increase survival, potentially quality of life, but they don't come without complications. This is a pictograph developed by our group um, where we used a systematic review um, and collated all the data um, to develop one-year risks uh, for patients and their families. So any patient that gets an LVAD can expect a 55% chance of being re-hospitalized for any cause, 20% chance of having major bleeding after the surgical period, that's GI bleeding or nosebleeds, a 10% chance of a stroke, a 20% chance of a device-related infection, and that's usually due to the external driveline component. 5% chance of a device malfunction due to clotting, so a clot develops in the VAD and the VAD needs to be exchanged. And an 18% chance of ongoing heart failure. So you can see it's not an easy decision to make, and we do feel that the decision to get a destination therapy all that is much different than someone who has the hope of a transplant at the end. So I'm going to hand it over back to Larry to talk a little bit about gaps in decision-making. So just briefly, um, you can see that this is a very complex therapy with um, very complex decision-making. In a sense, these are patients who are sick and essentially dying of their heart failure who are left with, um, you know, continuing on what they're doing, but probably in the very near future having 
to either go to hospice or undergo major surgery. Um, so informing patients about this decision and guiding the discussions is obviously critical. The problem is that I don't think that this is done very well in our current system. So this is, I love these demotivations. If you ever get on the internet, um, they're great for talks. But this is one we actually have in our office. It kind of de describes the way that we approach outcomes research. So challenges. I expected times like this, but never thought they'd be so bad, so long, and so frequent. So here, this also describes, I think, the, the way that patients are informed about these big decisions. So um, a lot of times people have informed consent when they're going to undergo a major procedure. So if you're going to go in for surgery, you get a form where the doctor or the surgeon sits down with you and describes the risks and benefits and helps you understand whether you should go through with that surgery or not. And one, I think that that's a limited approach to decision making, but I think it's even worse here where this is an incredibly complex decision, and yet the state of the art is that the, the guidelines that came out for mechanical circulatory support and whether people should get an LVAD actually came up with this appendix to give to programs around the country to say, hey, this is a, a really good informed consent for this complex decision. So they published this in 2013, and this is a seven-page, single-space type, single typed document. This is exactly what it looks like, which I think it's amusing. Not only is it not particularly visually appealing, there's a lot of spelling errors in it, which I, is, you know, spell check would have been nice. But, I, but we actually took this through as, um, and looked at what the grade level is for this, and it's 14.6. So this is the state of the art. You get the smartest people together who supposedly know how to help patients decide whether they should get an LVAD. And they, this is tremendous outcomes. And I really appreciate what industry has done to move this along. But industry is industry. And their job is to sell devices. And they're beholden to their you know, people who buy stock. And so their goal is to sell these. So they have information available for patients and doctors and clinicians and other people and family members. And theirs is really marketing. And so this is uh, just the beginning of a video they have that's entitled Shared Decision Making for LVADs. And needless to say, it has one view of how this should, should look. So we actually took Matt, Matt Acovedo is a, a medical student. He, and his project, he came up to us, said he wanted to do something. And Dan Matlock very um, uh, astutely said, well, why don't we just review all the information that's out there? So rather than doing kind of the medical journal systematic review, we sent Matt over to the library and we said, why don't you work with the librarians to figure out how to find whatever a patient or a caregiver could find out there. So either from programs or from industry or from societies. And he went through and he found about 160 materials on LVADs. We applied some very basic criteria to say that this would be something of substance. And he came up with 77 materials that would be appropriate for education for patients and caregivers on VAD. And what we found is that 97% of these contained the benefits, not surprising, but only half actually talked about any risks associated with this procedure, and there are plenty, as you just saw. Um, only 36% talked about lifestyle considerations, only 10% talked about caregiver-related issues, even though a caregiver is required for patients to get this device, and then only one mentioned hospice or palliative care as an alternative or, or talked about it. He actually went through 14 that actually met a few kind of criteria that would actually say this could be used as a decision aid. So only 14 out of 160. And what he found is that zero met the international patient decision aid um, criteria. Um, of only two or 14 percent had a readability at or below the eighth grade level. Most were way too high. And then 93 percent were significantly biased towards accepting an LVAD, which is not surprising since most of this is made by industry here selling the devices. So with that, I'm going to go on to part three. So that's a little bit of a background. And so what we sought to do was to develop decision aid. So both a pamphlet and a video, which Jocelyn will talk a little bit more about, but to provide patients and their caregivers an objective view of what it's like to live with an LVAD, but also to, to highlight some of the people that maybe didn't choose to get an LVAD going forward. So in order to do this, we really needed some pilot work. We needed to know exactly how patients, caregivers, and people who dealt with these devices really felt about how the current educational process was going. 
So we framed the needs assessment after the Ottawa Decision Support Framework and conducted semi-structured uh, qualitative interviews of patients, caregivers, and mechanical circulatory support coordinators who are primarily RNs um, dealing with this really unique patient population. So we interviewed 22 patients, 15 patients who had, had already received an LVAD, and seven people who had declined getting an LVAD. Uh, 16 caregivers um, of patients who had accepted an LVAD and one caregiver of a patient who declined. Seven of those um, were bereaved caregivers, so the patient had already died by the time we interviewed them. And then um, the MCS coordinators were all over the country, um, 18 different centers, 18 different coordinators. And what we found, I and mean, we found a lot of data, a lot of different perspectives, but the patient perspective was particularly interesting. We found a dichotomous decision-making uh, framework for patients, and people usually fell into one of the two categories. Either they were reflective or they were automatic. The reflective patients were the utilitarian type group, and they said things like, I thought about it an awful lot. And in contrast, we saw the automatic group that were really focused on self-preservation, and they said things like, there was no choice. And it was interesting to see that patients really fell into one of these two categories regardless of what we ask them about. So this is just an example of weighing risks and benefits. And so we asked patients, um, had they considered, what did they consider about the risks? How did they go about making their decision? And the reflective patient, um, and both of them actually chose to get the LVAD, but the reflective patient on the left-hand side said something like, it was a hard choice. It wasn't an easy choice for me to make. If I get the LVAD, I live. If I don't get it, I die. Do I choose to live or do I choose to die? So I fumbled with that for a little while before I made the decision to do it. And in contrast, you can see a patient automatic when asked by the interviewer, did you weigh the pros and cons of the decision at all? And they responded, no, no, didn't even think twice about it. When they told me that I couldn't have a transplant, this was the only option that I had, that or push up daisies. So I automatically took this. So we use this to inform um, the IPDES, and this is where I'm going to hand it over to Jocelyn. Yeah, so when we started the um, process of developing a decision aid, we um, used the International Patient Decision Aid Standards as a guide um, for the development. And basically what these standards ask is for decision aids to um, present um, a balanced presentation of information about options available to the patient. Um, specifically presenting probabilities and um, also uh, having some sort of values clarification exercises or um, parts of the decision aids to really make sure that the decision um, is concordant with the patient's values. So we started with IPDES but actually built on that um, based on the needs assessment results that we found. Um, so like Colleen said, we um, started out with knowing we were going to make a paper, a paper pamphlet decision aid and a video decision aid. Um, so we first started out with um, creating the paper one first. And so we did several internal iterations of this. And once we felt like we got to a certain point, uh, we started interviewing patients, caregivers, and clinicians to assess um, acceptability and to see if there were any. Um, yep. Oh, oh there you go. Yeah. Um, so we did these interviews with stakeholders involved in the decision to see. Um, to assess acceptability and then to also just see if there were any um, major changes or recommendations to be made to the decision aids. Um, so at the end of it all, we had about 18 different versions, um, went through 18 different iterations of the paper decision aid, and we're currently um, on the fourth version and hopefully final version of the video decision aid. Um, so you can see there kind of the, the process and uh, the one on the right is the first page of the final version of the paper. Um, so. Based on the needs assessment, we found that a lot of patients um, made very this, said that this was a very emotional process for them. Um, so we started out in kind of a unique way um, by uh, having the first page be all about emotion. And so we recognize that this is a very emotional process. Um, we address emotion and we ask patients to really think about their values, to think about their goals for the end of the life of their life before we even present any informational um, pieces about LVAD or what DT means. Um, so here's some of the language that we use. Um, we're very direct in acknowledging that this is a very difficult decision. Um, and we try to use some normalizing language as well to say that um, these emotions are normal and that we understand this is a very emotional process. We move on to then discuss um, the basic concepts of DTLVAD um, and what that means and provide um, kind of an introduction to the technology. 
and move on to um, present both options in a very balanced and parallel manner. So um, we really tried to uh, give a broad overview of what life would be like with an LVAD and without an LVAD and give information that we think would be helpful for making a decision. Um, we also presented the information both in text and um, visually to make it understandable, as you can see there. Um, and what you don't see is actually at the top of this page, it starts out by saying, um, by really addressing uncertainty around all of this. You know, we say these are on summary numbers from studies that have occurred, but what will happen to each individual person is really uncertain. No one can predict your future. Um, so we kind of preface it by saying that, but that this is what it might look like here. Uh, we had dedicate a whole page to lifestyle changes, since that's a, such an integral part of this therapy. And um, actually, this is really powerful in the video because we actually show patients cleaning their driveline site, changing their batteries, putting their equipment in a shower protective case. And that really highlights um, to patients what is involved with having, um, with having this device. Uh, we also dedicate a good amount of time to palliative care and hospice. Um, we recognize that uh, patients who choose not to get an LVAD will likely be using these services um, sooner rather than later. But we also are careful to say that these are services that can be used for both patients who decline an LVAD, but also for patients who accept it. Um, saying that down the line, um, they may also want hospice or need hospice in the future too. Um, caregivers are very important and a very large part of the decision-making process and life after the decision. So we dedicate a whole page to caregivers and what that means for them um, uh, if the patient does decide to get an LVAD. And we felt this was very important to um, include this as part of uh, the decision making, decision aids as a whole, um, so patients can see what's being asked of caregivers as well, and so that these materials can be used um, as one for both patients and caregivers rather than having separate materials. And then um, the last page is um, some explicit values clarification exercises for patients um, to help them make a decision based on what's really most important to them. Um, the major difference between the paper decision aid and the video decision aid um, are these patient and caregiver testimonials that we've included. And we were very deliberate to include uh, clips of both sides of the decision and, out, and all of the outcomes that can happen from both sides of the decision and really tried to make a very balanced presentation. Um, so you can see here on the left is Cliff, who is currently living with a DTL VAD. And on the right is Don, who declined a DT LVAD. Um, so we really, uh, we really gave a. This, these have actually been very powerful, and people have really liked these. But we were very careful to make sure that we didn't present one side more than the other, and that we really um, were able to show what can happen um, in a variety of ways. We didn't see any quotes about the way you do that about the breath, the people who got it, and the problems they had. Right. We actually don't. Well, there is. So so when we actually present five different people in the video, and one of them is uh, an older patient um, who got an LVAD, actually did well with the LVAD, his device then clotted, and then he had to get it. Um, when we say you have to exchange the device, it means you go through open heart surgery all over again, which is typically more challenging than even the first time. And he had a very rough course of it afterwards. And so he talks a little bit about that he would, if he could do it all over again, he'd do it the first time again, but not the second time again. So there's a little bit of regret there. What's even more powerful is two things. One is that he looks terrible in the video. Um, and I think that that is powerful in and of itself. And the second is that although he doesn't, I think, express as much regret as maybe the, his picture does, his wife t is on there and talks about it. And I think she's also very powerful. She's very measured in what she says, but there's clearly some challenges around what she's gone through. And if you wanted to say that she has regret, I would say she probably has some. So I think, you know, it, it's very subtle about how to do this. And the way that we kind of figure out when we think we've hit the sweet spot is we show it to a bunch of people and the surgeons are telling us that there's no way we should show this to people because it's way too anti-LVAD. And then we show it to some other people who say this is way too pro LVAD, and then we feel like we've kind of reached a happy medium. So uh, that's kind of the iterative process of development. It's why we have 18 versions. Yep. Could you have patients take the videos? Well, we do to some extent. We video a variety of people, and then we kind of have people comment on what we think is you know, most helpful or least helpful. 
Um, the video is actually 30 minutes, which you know, there's a lot of logistics around this. So pe some people are asking for more, some people are asking for less. We try and get a good diversity, but we can't have everything. So we ask people, well, what was the most helpful to you? And we include those. So yes, we do that. To some extent, I think we, we have some say over that as well, because I think we've been spending a lot of time doing this as well. So it's really a, it's a group think effort. Um, and there are, you know, structured ways to go about this. But at the end of the day, it's kind of balancing a lot of opinions. And so, um, when we started on this project, I think we initially thought, wow, there's a clear need here. We've done some pilot projects to define that there's a real gap out there, that we can, we can see from our own patients how big this struggle is. And we thought we would write a grant to develop a decision aid. And we thought that would be great. And then the more we learned about PCORI and some other things, we realized that it would pro probably be unlikely for PCORI to give us a lot of money to develop a decision aid. Write a grant. We'd been working on the decision aid already. Um, but we decided to delay submitting the grant to PCORI to develop the decision aid that you just saw because we felt like that would give us a much better um, chance of getting it. What was interesting is that while we were delaying and finishing up the decision aid and then writing the dissemination and implementation grant, PCORI funded a grant to pay for somebody to develop a decision aid, which was needless to say very um, nerve-wracking at the time. So we decided to go ahead with what we were doing, but to really finish out the decision aid, submit that as a complete product, and then say we were going whole hog into doing implementation and decision, uh, sorry, and dissemination research, which I think is interesting for a number of reasons. One is that that's not really my comfort zone. Um, so it really pushed us a lot to think about it. It really forced us to engage the Accords program because that is where Accords has a lot of experience. Um, and the last thing is that if you really think about decision aids, if you, if you practice medicine, there are tons of decision aids out there, and a lot of them are reasonable. Um, there's even companies like HealthWise that publish a lot of these, but they're not used very much in, in clinical practice. And so while I think some of the pilot work we've done and the product that we've developed, um, I'm, it was one of the things I'm most proud of, what our group has done. Um, the real challenge is not to develop the decision aid. The real challenge is to figure out how to get people to use it. And so that's actually what we wrote, was um, this uh, PCORI study that was funded in July titled, A Multi-Center Trial of a Shared Decision Support Intervention for Patients and Their Care Caregivers Offered Destination Therapy for End-Stage Heart Failure. Um, and so our team put this together and, and was funded uh, for $1.5 million plus indirect. So it's a large study. Um, and let me take you through kind of some of what we, what we plan to do, and then I'm going to let Jocelyn talk about the details. So the big picture is we did our decision needs assessment. Um, we had actually seven separate papers that were published off of those needs assessments. Then we developed a decision support uh, tool, which is actually mostly decision aid, but also some work about how do you um, provide decision training to give the providers context about how to use it. Um, and so we reached out to people who know how to do that. Um, and then we package that in our grant, and the grant is essentially around, you know, um, what is the implementation and, and, uh, and dissemination of this product, and we'll show you how we're going to measure that. And then the final piece would really be to kind of have ongoing use of this to help, to help people out in the world, um, and also iterative development, because the technologies here are improving so rapidly. You have to have a way that two years from now, we can update this product and make um, what it does still applicable to new situations. Yep. I actually meant to say that and I forgot to. So we, um, we it's a great question. So one is I, I think it's a good example of how to really be competitive for large grants, you have to have good pilot data. And getting good pilot data means you have to have the time to do it and the funding to do it. So we were... Um, very lucky. Uh, both Dan Matlock and I both have career development awards. So at those K awards, um, mine's through the NHLBI, his is through the NIA, but through NIH, come with some project support. Um, and so we had some money to do things, but ultimately the thing that really got this going was a being able to bring uh, Jocelyn onto our group, uh, into our group and to do what she does. She has a master's in um, uh, health communication, which has been a great asset in addition to that she just is amazing in many aspects. But um, the way that we paid for a Jocelyn's salary is that 
Um, Dr. Schwartz, who is the chair of medicine here, when he came on uh, as the chair a few years ago, um, instead of setting up some kind of traditional endowed professorships, he decided that he wanted to do the opposite, which is to have professorships that come with some money, but you only get them for five years and they're early so that they help you get established, not that they allow you once you're established to just stay on faculty indefinitely. So I, I got one um, uh, two years ago and Dan got one of these awards one year ago. And so um, we each have about $75,000 a year of flexible funding that essentially we're not beholden or responsible to anybody. And that is an investment by the Department of Medicine and the School of Medicine and this campus to really say that we recognize people need to have some money to get pilot data. And if they do, they can write big grants that bring in more dollars. And so I think this is an example of how that can be successful. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking. So let me take you through um, our grant called Decide LVAD. So the PCORI grants are three years. So we really have three years total. And so when you think about enrollment and other things, we really only have two years to do this project because we needed time to finish it at the end and get things started with contracts um, and IRBs at the beginning. We, um, LVAD is a pretty kind of small niche thing. And so even though programs are expanding what they do, the numbers are small. So we had to go to various sites to be able to do this, which not only increases our numbers, but also teaches us about generalizability. Um, and, uh, and then what we, we really struggled with in terms of understanding this is, well, how do you roll this out in a way that's scientific? Um, to see if it's really helping people. So we struggled both with how do you roll it out and second, what do you measure? And I'm going to talk about both of those things very briefly. So the first issue is about rollout. We ended up ultimately, with the help of Diane Fairclough here, deciding to use a stepped wedge design. And um, I'm going to come back to this slide in just a second. But we said, well, why not do a classic patient level randomization? And the problem is, is that using a decision aid to talk with patients well, you could really an intervention that is randomized at the program level, the doctors, the nurse practitioners, the, the nurses. And so it's very hard to say to those people who are implementing it, only do it with this one person and don't do it with the other. So this concept of diffusion across patients is very problematic. So we decided this really had to be a program level randomization. Okay. However, a cluster randomization, if we said we had three sites who used it and three sites who didn't, one, you get into trouble with power. The other is that over time, you get into trouble with diffusion of this across sites as well. So the sites that aren't randomized may start picking these things up. So we ultimately decided that the best way to do this was to have everybody in the study, everybody start off with what they're currently doing, and then randomize them to actually get transitioned over to the intervention over time. And I think that there are problems with this. There can still be diffusion early on um, but overall, I think this is a much the kind of the only way we could have really done this study at the level that we're doing it. Uh, to, to truly do a cluster uh, study would have been much bigger. Um, so I think that that significantly helped, um, helped us in terms of the design. Um, the other is what were we going to do for outcomes? So obviously, we want to know that these things work and make people's decisions better. And so they end up, you know, overall making decisions that are good for them. But that's actually challenging to measure. And so um, using uh, Russ's uh, REAIM framework has been really helpful for us. So the E in REAIM, as you all know as well as I do, is about effectiveness. And so <clears throat> we um, have kind of two effectiveness measures. One is knowledge, because we feel like if people don't improve their knowledge at all, well, that's a very low bar to pass. But if we're implementing this and, and people's understanding of the process is no better than prior to us using our decision aid, then I think that says that we're not doing it very well. But more important than that is decision quality. And there are measures of whether people's values and goals are concordant with the decision that they make. And so there are values, um, measures of values and values concordance and actually decision regret. Somebody asked about regret. We have a decision re regret measure. And those are the kinds of things that we're asking about at the patient level and the caregiver level for effectiveness. However, again, this is really about implementation and dissemination. So we want to know not only does decision aid work, but does it actually reach the people that we want it to reach? Um, so without further ado, I'm going to 
we'll finish up with our last section, which is talk about how this is designed to measure these other uh, domains. So um, the first domain, reach, is pretty simple in the fact that we're just going to be um, counting the number of uh, patients and caregivers who receive the decision support intervention during the intervention period. So really simply just asking coordinators which materials the patients and caregivers received during that time. Um, effectiveness, like uh, Larry said, is um, based all around data collection from patients and caregivers. So any patient um, who's being considered for a DTLVAD will be approached for the study and their primary caregiver. And we're going to be asking them to complete surveys at baseline, one month, and six months. And um, our primary outcome that we're assessing here um, is quality of the decision. So with that is, um, is the knowledge of the therapy high and is the decision that they've made um, align with their values that they've stated. Uh, a host of secondary outcomes as well as, uh, as decision regret, as Larry mentioned, decision conflict, control preferences, um, and many more. So here's just a table um, giving you, uh, showing you all the measures we're collecting uh, for both patient and caregiver along the way. Um, you'll notice that we're collecting uh, both knowledge and decision conflict at enrollment and um, right after patients and caregivers have seen the educational materials. Um, during follow-up, along with collecting a lot of the same measures at baseline, we're also going to be looking at decision regret, um, uh, satisfaction with caregiver involvement in the decision, acceptability of the educational materials. Um, what's a little bit unique as well with this population is that we do expect um, a somewhat large number of bereaved caregivers that will be um, enrolled um, and they will be bereaved at follow-up. So we uh, are still wanting to capture this population. So we will ask them to do follow-up um, surveys as well, and we've uh, even included some specific bereaved uh, measures with those surveys. For the AIM portion, we're going to be assessing this in two different ways, um, specifically uh, assessing the programs themselves. So the first is uh, quantitatively with the study coordinator checklist, which will um, allow us to understand how the educational materials were used. So for instance, um, who was the primary person who provided the educational materials? How did the patients view these? Were they usually um, watched uh, in the hospital when the patient was on, inpatient uh, on the television screen? Or were they given to patients to take home um, after clinic visits? Uh, did patients typically watch the whole video or just watch parts? Um, things like that. We will also do uh, qualitative interviews with clinicians at each site. So we're going to aim to um, interview a variety of staff type, um, from nurses on the floor to the surgeons and cardiologists to maybe even some admin staff. Um, so just uh, basically trying to get at a variety of people who are involved in the uh, DTL bad decision making process. Um, we're going to interview them at three different time points. So the baseline interview will um, occur during the control period prior to the intervention rollout. And this is for us to understand what the current process looks like. Um, the follow-up interview will occur uh, during the intervention period after it's been implemented for um, quite a while for us to understand how the implementation process has been going um, to see uh, has there been resistance from some staff to the adoption of the intervention? Um, has there been difficulties with implementing the intervention? How does this look like this process look like now compared to what it was before the intervention? Things like that. And then after the study is completed, we will do another follow-up interview, and this is mostly to um, assess maintenance. Um, do programs intend to continue to use the intervention? Um, which parts do they plan on continue using? Why won't they continue using certain other parts? Um, things like that. So uh, to start out with, um, we've been working on a pilot uh, just to kind of see if there's any big problems that have been occurring or that have come up or and to refine the trial study design and procedures. And Colleen um, actually got uh, a grant from the Heart Failure Society of America for uh, a year and we're doing a, a, implementing this intervention locally here only to start out. And so, so far we've um, enrolled eight patients and seven caregivers over the last couple months. And um, we actually were initially pretty concerned with the length of the 26 minute, minute video decision aid, uh, thinking it would be too long and too much for the patient. But we've actually found that uh, almost everyone has thought that the length has not been a problem at all. Some people kind of actually wish it was longer. Um, so that's been kind of interesting to see. 
And then on the flip side, we found that, um, you know, because these patients are very sick, a lot of them are hospitalized at the time of enrollment, that uh, we need to make sure that the survey itself isn't too burdensome. So we've um, made sure to include measures that are only the measures that are necessary. And actually, we've um, changed a little bit of the survey based on the pilot work we've done so far. Um, and then the last big concern that we've uh, discovered is that this patient population is actually very popular for research. Um, there's a, currently a lot of uh, industry, tri industry trials going on um, for LVAD. There's uh, other research going on for heart failure patients. So there's a lot of study overlap. And um, a lot of these patients are approached for multiple studies. So we're trying to make sure that we don't overburden the patient and um, make, the, make sure that this is feasible for this patient population. And then just to kind of go with the precise um, trial or the precise uh, measure here, we've basically decided that this project is very pragmatic and um, the only, we're really just trying to assess if this is viable in a real world setting and to see if this intervention can be implemented um, within the current process. So, yes. Go ahead, yeah, either way. Oh, I was just gonna say, given the pragmatic nature, do you concern yourself much with crossing limits in studies or do you try to avoid that? Um, I think for our study, it's okay, but we know that some other studies may have problems. Uh, the industry trials seem to be okay with cross enrollment. Mm -hmm. It's a huge issue, though. I mean, I think one of the biggest things we've struggled with is this, um, this the overlap between studies. I mean, everybody wants to study like patients who are uh, dealing with huge technologies that, to extend life, you know, and so this. We had a patient last week who essentially was getting ready to be enrolled for, uh, or, or uh, being considered for LVAD, and there were eight studies currently ongoing that the patient could be eligible for. And they can participate in some, um, you know, but they can't really do all eight. And uh, Colleen was saying there was like people lined up at the door after the patient got admitted. So, you know, it, it, it is challenging and it's hard too because you, we all know how hard it is to do research. So, I, you know, when people say, oh, you can't enroll my patient, I almost get angry. And then here I am saying, well, you actually can't enroll your patient because our study is more important. Right. Um, and you, so, want to, you want to, like, keep it. I mean, how else can you really know what your effects are of this cross enrollment, but at the same time, it's real world studies? So. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the scientific issues about cross enrollment are not that big here to some extent. I mean, um, a lot of what we're trying to learn about how to use a decision aid doesn't really matter that much whether they get device A or device B. Right. So I wonder though, I mean, many of the different device studies, so like, I guess it just could not get, they're having to collect that data from those studies. They are. Well, the main device that's used now is just approved. Right. But in terms, so are you right? Because you could be influencing adverse events in a report. If the old version was so confusing, no one was really, and now you've been highlighting for them adverse events that you might expect, they want to be there for better report. So, are you getting any, any, any companies picking up on that? It's, you know, you, you wouldn't interfere with the effectiveness and validity and all of that, but in yeah. terms of adverse event reporting, you know. Well, um, one is most of the patients are not in a device study currently, or if they are, there's like one of them is an anticoagulation study, so they're kind of, but I agree there's, there's definitely potential there. To some extent, um, uh, you know, most of those studies are at many sites anyway, so I think that, you know, each site is different, and so the fact that we may be conducting this study about letting people have more education about the device, I'm not sure necessarily, you know, markedly undermines the, uh, the validity of a randomized device trial. I think the bigger concern we have from both industry, but more so the fact that this is a very lucrative part of what the University of Colorado does, is that there's some question about whether we're encouraging our people not to get the devices. Mm -hmm. And um, that people are very sensitive to that because to some extent we talk about industry being biased towards putting these devices in. Well, when I put on my clinical cap, and then I go and talk to my chief. He says, well, last year you guys did 45 devices. And this year, how many are you going to do? Because this is our bread and butter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, we all wear a lot of different hats in medicine, but this is a great example of where 
bias is everywhere, and you have to be cognizant of, of, of where it comes out. So I have two, two questions about where it's being delivered and by who. That seems to be a huge thing, at least in my mind. So it sounds like a lot of these people are in the hospital, so it's probably just involving cardiologists and surgeons. So um, the majority of patients get this done in the hospital because they need a point where there's really no other option between hospice organs and LBAT. So they're, they're sick, a lot of them. Depends on when they introduce the LBAT. So a lot of times it's introduced in the outpatient setting, but they get to a point in the hospital where they can't leave the hospital. It, so it's, it's introduced by cardiologists then? So I mean, usually is the PCP like, ever involved? Hmm. I mean, yeah, I was trying to think like, about, you know, yeah. like people might have a very, it, it might be introduced to them very differently, I would imagine, mm -hmm. by a surgeon versus their primary care provider. And right. I don't know. A couple of times, one of the reasons that we believe that the decision aid is important is because of what you just said, that a surgeon may give you a very skewed picture of this, and somebody who doesn't really understand it may give you it. So one of the things that Decision Aid does is standardizes the presentation and requires people who even know a lot about it to go through and say, what is most important, what is most helpful, let's put that down and ground the conversation in that. So I, I totally agree with you, but I think it's part of the reason we're doing this study. The second issue is just medically. These devices are interesting. So um, they're sometimes used in people who have fulminant myocarditis, and those people don't usually get referred by their primary care physician. They feel bad one day, and they have flu symptoms the next day, and the third day they're in the ED in shock, and then all of a sudden they're being like, you know, transplant eval, do what happens. Um, but the majority of these people um, have chronic heart failure that's symptomatic, that's progressed over the course of years. And you know, I just saw a recent study that looked at if you take people with symptomatic heart failure, only 14% of them die suddenly. 86% of them go through a progressive course. So the question is, do you move this upstream? And I think one of the lessons that you all might find helpful, and we didn't actually put in here, is when we when we got um, when we put in the grant and we talked about stakeholders. Um, again, Dan Matlock was brilliant because. What he said is we've got a good um, we've got a good decision aid. We can show this to people, and we should say if our study's positive, would you be willing to use this? So we went to the joint commission and had them review it. And the joint commission has a program, a certification program in advanced heart failure. And they wrote us a letter that, that said we love this. We would be willing to have this as a recommended piece of advanced heart failure programs if you all show that it's effective. Then we went to the American College of Cardiology and did the same thing. So at the end of the day, we're saying that this should be used in the hospital primarily for those discussions that are going on. But I think that it kind of stands on its own. And so one of the things we'll investigate is we're already starting to put this on websites, which I think creates possibility for diffusion. But I think it also allows us to learn how is this being up, how what is the uptake and how are people using this kind of who aren't necessarily in the hospital where it's formally a part of a program. And so we'll learn about that as well. Um, so along the same line of thinking of the patient, have you shared this at all with FDA? Because I think they, you know, on the, on the drug side, the whole thing around medication guide and decision is just getting 30 days in drugs. That's, I don't know personally how much is really going on on the price side. And uh, I think it has very, very interesting, and I think it turned out to be another stakeholder group that could have a broader effect. If you really think that industry is not really giving a fair balance, but I don't know if you're familiar with there's a division of drug marketing and advertising mm -hmm. leading that. And you can actually, you know, write a letter, uh, you know, you have a formal way of saying this might be an area that they should look at. And here's the evidence that we have or you know what you have, etc. Um, you know, it's not a research line, but it does get the impact of what you're doing in terms of how, how you, you know, your message is clear, but not just of who the, the medical society is, but also kind of the community. Yeah, I, I, well, one, that's a great comment, so I, I think we should definitely consider that. Um, to some extent, uh, <clears throat> so when they approved these devices, actually the FDA required a post-marketing surveillance registry called Intermax. And the head of Intermax is actually one of our sites. 
So to some extent, we built in the relationships around that. The second is that this um, pro project actually came off of some of the work that Dan Matlock initially started with defibrillators, which are also devices regulated by the FDA. And um, uh, so anyway, I think he's already engaged in some of those conversations. And the work around ICDs is a little ahead of where we are here. So I think the lessons from various projects can be cross-applied. Um, but it is a great comment to, to think about FDA, but even more generally, what are governmental agencies that can help make sure that if these are good ideas, that they get disseminated that way? So you may be aware of um, there's a, um, a bill that's going to be put forward in, in the House that uh, Representative McGann is one of the co-sponsors. Are you familiar with it? Um, I actually saw an email about this. Yeah, it's um, 21st, I, medical, 21st century medicine or something like that. And one of the key platforms is to get patient engagement earlier in the drug, you know, medical and drug, drug development process. And it may be another area, especially since we have the FDA locally mm -hmm. who's kind of a sponsor, to think about how your learnings, if that's really what you're doing, is getting you know, the patient voice in as part of the development process and, and the materials, um, it might be another place to kind of showcase the work that you're doing. Very meaningful. So I, I'm just on another the Corey kind of application that's pushing it from drug risk everything. And I don't think there's as much going on in terms of from medical device risk. Maybe I mean you're more familiar. But probably other than what you guys are doing, it, 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 it's pretty tremendous. And I think the agency should be aware of that. So if you're meeting contacts but you don't have ID proof. Okay, great. I'll mention it to Dan. So he's saying this White House command center is too feel like you guys are getting to make this thing with people caring or like providers who are interested in the work that you're doing for their patients and how do you how do you deal with that? It sounds like going with a joint commission and doing some of these big efforts to get it recognized as important is, is good, but do you deal with that in a study or have you like how did you really get provider buy-in? Because that's something that we're really well, struggling with. I think we're still we're still going to see how it goes. I think it depends on the provider. But you know, some of the surgeons and the medical directors of that we've sold it is that a lot of these patients they want to, they, their primary priority is live as long as possible. And an LVAD doesn't promise that you're going to live longer, but on average, it's, the odds are pretty darn good. So a lot of what this does is it tries, I think, not to dissuade people from making that choice. But to make sure that that choice is uh, is one that they kind of thought through what it is that's coming down the line, that they're more uh, mentally uh, as well as emotionally prepared, that they've made arrangements better, that they understand better what the responsibilities of the caregiver are going to be, so that hopefully their experience and their satisfaction with with this is better, even though we don't expect that the actual number of decisions to be a whole lot different. In terms of people accepting and declining this device. So we'll see, but I think one, we have to explore that. And, and at this point, we're trying to sell that a little bit to get by. Are there any concerns? I wasn't sure if they're very eligibility, but do they have to agree to just discuss it? I mean, I assume that the decision making tool would have to agree that they you know, can engage in the conversation. I just wonder if there are other subset of people that actually don't want to. Yeah, um, so we we piloted on every single patient um, currently that's been worked out for UC LVAD at University of Denver, I think, and every single one has agreed to participate. Um, I think it's an it's such an area of uncertainty, and patients are really thrown a lot of information very quickly, and the process is vigorous and intense. I mean, there are financial coordinators, social workers, there's testing, surgeons have to see them, the coordinators have to see them. So I think, I've not heard that too much information is, is too much. Um, I've heard not enough, more so. Um, they also all are required to give tied care as part of different committees. Um, so that kind of opens up a whole other area of discussion. I think there will be some resistance. I mean, it's rolling it out at this site. It'll also depend on how you're pitching the study and how you want to engage in contacts and everything. 
our initial interviews with patients, there was interest in it, even then looking back, a lot of them were like, well, there was no choice. I was going to do this. Um, but they were still willing to hear a little bit more about what was involved. So just a thing remains to keep in mind. With Consilia, you'll be interested in it, is that I struggle with how much cognitive dissonance do you create for patients? Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's interesting that the other group that got funded by PCORI to develop the decision aid is actually primarily a group of ethicists. So I would not expect this at all, but their conclusion from the work they've been doing is that patients have mostly decided that they want this device. And so our job, this is what, these are ethicists, our job is actually not to create cognitive dissonance and suggest that they shouldn't get it because that's just unfair. Our job in having the decision made is actually to just help them understand what it is that they're getting into. What they've already decided. That's right. So it's really interesting because one, I would not have guessed that ethics would come at it that way. And I actually strongly disagree. I think, I, I feel like, remember back in chemistry, they talked about the activation energy and then you get to a lower level. And I personally think that this is a major decision. And it's not a pretty situation for a lot of people to be in. And there's some tough stuff to go through. But I think pushing people a little to get past some of their denial and fear or whatever will create some kind of cognitive dissonance initially, but at the end of the day, they're in a better place. And this other group has said, no, don't even go there. Mm -hmm. And, and I, it's, a, it's a real interesting difference that I would not have expected. And, Am I right? No, but I do this a lot, and, and we take care of these patients, and these ethicists, they don't. And I, I have to say, I think, at the end of the day, that ignoring all that denial and fear and everything leads to some pretty unhappy things when things don't go, when, you know, bad outcomes happen. So, but, but how do you decide that? I mean, some of it's personal experience, some of it's these interviews, some of it is studying how the decision making works, and whether people really don't like it. Talking to them six months later, are they really happy even though they didn't like it initially? Now that they say, wow, I'm really glad you showed that to me because when I had my stroke, I wasn't totally surprised about that. We've taken up more of your time. That was fascinating. So I want to thank you very much for coming. Thanks for the suggestion. Great question. Thank you. Thank you.